How you doing? Wonderful. I'm doing just fantastic. Yeah, as I mentioned, I just recently started a political show, uh, the Luke Beasley Show, for any of your followers, Luke Beasley on YouTube. And I've been a follower of you for a while. And so, you know, when you say something just so absurd, I had to reach out. Right. Uh, remind me what it was that I said that's so absurd. Fill me in. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so... Obviously, I, I get that the tension's running high with the Roe v. Wade news. Uh, I'm what the kids call a sock dim, so with you on most issues, but obviously down the road we would maybe disagree. Mm -hmm. um, so actually on the policy prescriptions, we would agree on the conversation around abortion, but the way in which you obviously responded to that news was calling Republicans, and then you went on to specify Republican politicians, maybe primarily, uh, were demons and human flesh. Mm -hmm. And I saw that... Uh, Which is medically true, by the way. Scientific studies have been done. Right. I brought all the studies to, um, you know, fight you on that. And <laughs> I saw that you talked to a conservative, and I saw the title, and got nervous that he was going to argue with you about this exact same thing. But then y'all's conversation went more into him saying, ah, it's not that bad, all these different things. That's not where I want to go at all. I agree with you on how bad any of these given issues. I mean, the fact that you would be pro-life, quote-unquote, um, wanting to minimize abortions, but then also want to ban co uh, contraception. Makes no sense. I'm not saying I defend. Or y'all got into the conversation around um, the demonization of trans people and all that. None yeah. of those things was, am I going to be like, oh, don't, don't call them evil because it's not that bad. That's not my point at all. It was definitely uh, a bit tangential. Oh, by the way, there are people in chat asking for your name and pronouns, just to be clear. Yeah, uh, Luke Beasley and pronouns are he, him. All right. All right. Uh, thank you. But yeah, go on, go on right ahead. Um, absolutely. So I guess I'm not trying to kind of, oh my God, look at all these quotes. But I did write them down just so we could kind of hash them out. Mm -hmm. And my biggest concern is what does it do for our movement using that type of rhetoric? For, instead of um, us arguing on if Republicans are evil or not, because that's kind of a pointless conversation in my mind, mm -hmm. more so it's, is it a good strategy to be calling them that um, for our own movement? So you kind of feel like that's good? Agree uh, that? uh, yeah, I do. Um, I think we're I think we're rapidly reaching the point where our ability to uh, achieve our political goals is going to come down to convincing liberals like yourself um, that this is no longer a political conflict which can be won exclusively through, you know, um, tr traditional institutionalist political discourse because the Democratic Party isn't really willing or able to operate as an effective agent of change on our behalf, um, instead that we need to be preparing for more dire civil conflict. Uh, and in so doing, we need these, the stakes to be understood fully, uh, which, you know, obviously I want to impress upon my audience. And I do fully believe that. Yeah, so one of the things that bothers me whenever I hear people talking about, we can't keep going with what we're doing, and the lack of action from our current Democratic Party is proof that anything other than kind of dramatic, dramatic, maybe revolutionary type um, actions isn't going to work. And they'll say like, uh, an example of this is that's outside the conversation we're having is people will be saying, oh, they've been saying reform the police for ages and nothing's happened. That's why we have to completely abolish the police or something. And to me, it's like, yeah, but they've been saying that and, and we've never gotten people in office or at least enough of them who are actually going to try to reform the police. So it's the same thing. Um, with this, where you're saying we're, we're past the point, we've seen time and time again, this isn't your wording, but the Democratic Party or the left in this country tries a certain strategy while the right goes further and further um, right, and it just doesn't work. And to me, an actual progressive movement that doesn't go all the way to kind of like violent rhetoric could dramatically change the political landscape and bring over a lot of the quote unquote moderates or center rightish people who don't want to uh murder people right and uh <laughs> so let's so yeah. let's let's hone in on this um 
you talk about um, nonviolent rhetoric. Okay. So I'm a, I'm a big advocate for defensive violence here, you know. Um, I do mm -hmm. think we're in the preliminary stages of a genocide against queer people in particular, but probably adjacent groups as well. Uh, and in such an environment, I think it is politically irresponsible to uh, treat the agents of that genocide with anything other than the greatest possible degree of moral condemnation. See, there are historical examples of your strategy not working. Usually when fascist governments begin to take power, there is a outspoken liberal contingent that mocks, downplays, attempts to civilly reason with, pull people over, and then of course invariably they're silenced or killed. The fascists take power uh, anyway, because people just seem to be more responsive to alarmist rhetoric, you know. Um, yeah, I'm, but I'm not talking at all about uh, minimizing or standing by. There's a difference between being you could be super alarmist this is so dangerous without saying this is a class of people that is and just so you know i'm not like morally horrified oh my god he called them i'm literally just thinking from a strategy point of view um without setting a group of people into a non-human category because i feel like i've heard you talk about this on stream before even with people like nazis if we say okay they're monsters they're not human they're something different, then we're not, yeah, I definitely have heard you talk about this, um, then we're not able to understand, okay, how do they get there? How could we take them out of it? Or how could we even fight them? Because you don't really know how to conceptualize a fight against an inhuman monster. I agree with can, that from an analytical yeah. perspective when we're talking about average people, not so much when we're talking about politicians, you know. There, for instance, there's a difference between some random 16-year-old neo-Nazi and Nick Fuentes. And that Nick Fuentes not only perpetuates the system, but actively benefits from his participation in it. Same with the Republican politicians, you know. Um, I think that oftentimes pulling people out of very, like, far-right movements is about helping them understand they've been duped, misled, their life is being harmed. But for these people, their life isn't being harmed. Matt Gates's life is not being worsened by being a fascist in power. It's benefited significantly. So at that point, it's no longer a matter of convincing them or moving them away. It's a matter of fomenting a suitable degree of political opposition, which obviously I believe is uh, farther than what you might believe it needs to be. The crazy thing, though, about this new uh, sect of the Republican Party, this we think of as the more fascistic, far, far right um, kind of category, is they are very much, not on some things, they're still very pro-corporate a lot of times, stuff like that, but in the areas where, that they really define them, they're actually representing a lot of their base very well. And so in a democracy, they're just very clearly self-interested politicians who are seeing a increasingly radicalized base that wants to get meat to, thrown to them all the time, um, calling for that, and they, they answer. And so it's not like, uh, to me, someone who's evil, and kind of what you were talking about in your video that I'm responding to, was, listen, we can reason and understand people when they're doing it for their own gain, but we can't understand people when it's literally just to make somebody suffer. And in the case of the politicians like Mac H that you're talking about, it's not just to make people suffer. It is making people suffer, and it's horrible, but it's out of complete self-interest, as you just said. He's benefiting from his base loving him because he's doing all these radical actions. And I think if you're willing to accept that the voters aren't just, uh, you know, demons in human flesh, well, then the politicians aren't really either just really self-interested people looking terms to of, uh, stay in office. In terms of their moral, uh, you know, how I would judge them morally, I can't say there would be that much of a difference. The only difference is how you can treat them in terms of what approaches are politically efficacious. And I always think that it's more acceptable to take hardline uh, stances against people in power than, uh, you know, just random citizens, even if they have the same political positions. Also, of course, even the farthest right random Republican dipshits can potentially be convinced out of their positions. You can't convince a politician out of their positions. Right, their lot, whole but... job <clears throat> is to do the things that they say they're going to do. You can't debate them out of that. Right, but if someone's listening to you walk them through, okay, these people, picture them, are demons in human flesh, then it stops there. Like if I'm running down that logic train and I'm thinking, okay, this is the person that I fully trust, I would stop the analysis there because if someone is truly purely evil, they're just Satan, then they're just trying to harm people 
and I can't really understand how do we combat them because they're just going, going, going. But if you understand that they're just trying to represent a, a radical uh, base, and then you also understand that the best thing you can do to um, change the radical base's mind is not address them in such a way, then the goal now you have an, an actual. I think you're conflating a, a few to, things. There's no nothing mutually exclusive there. You can say a person is evil while also recognizing there are socioeconomic justifications for their behavior. Evil is really not, a, not the analysis that you had. It was just like that's well, it. Game at no over. point we can't pull them out of it, but we totally no can pull voters I, out of it. I've never made this an intrinsic thing. This isn't like people being born evil. Well, yeah, Maybe you could course. say it's their job to be evil, but even evil isn't like a real moral category. The closest thing that I could really come up to it, you know, outside of rhetorical shorthand is um, the axioms that they are attempting to maximize with their behavior are in stark contradiction to the outcomes of the axioms that I would like to put about. So for example, if they're fascists and they believe in a fundamental sense, you know, um, the, in, in rigid hierarchy and the promotion of like an anti-degenerate social order that would starkly contradict with any invocation of my axioms because it would entail genocide against queer people. So in that sense, you know, you might say, well, evil is a shorthand. The long form would be that their axiomatic outcomes are uh, mutually uh, exclusive to, to mine. You know, they contradict. Yeah, so I understand what you're saying, but it all is a rhetoric game. And if you take someone who's, um, I have a, a few friends who I would say are from center left, center and center right, kind of all around that little spectrum. And watching their engagement with politics is super interesting because I got in a conversation about abortion with a, a family member. And afterwards she was like, oh my gosh, I don't know if I, I still feel like I'm pro-life. I don't know if I agree with you, but that actually makes a lot of sense. Like it's about, all the reasons we say about autonomy, the uh, baby or to be baby, the fetus being biologically dependent on the mother, so then she has right over it. Uh, and she had not even heard that explanation laid out for her anywhere. And so I'm picturing her being like, gosh, the right wing's pretty crazy. And she flips over, okay, maybe not this person, but someone who's younger flips over to uh, your channel. And your response to the news is not, oh, we really got to deprogram people, but the leaders of this movement are just fundamental, or I don't know how exactly, no, yeah, yeah, let's see. They're just evil, fundamentally evil, not human beings. I feel um, like- And she's gonna go like, wow, okay, that's definitely radical too. And then we have a bunch of people who are just status quo, uh, excite, you know, all super excited about the status quo. I feel like the- Because uh, the everything else is radical. What you're talking about right now was kind of like the liberal myth, like the starry-eyed dream. If this was the case, My why has none- strong. Why has none of the moderate or like center leaning or bipartisan messaging of the Democratic Party brought over anyone? Republicans because, exactly, were as galvanized. Because they, they uh, co-opted that language. You understand it as much as I do. The quote unquote moderates in Congress slash the Senate, you know, the House and Senate, or even Biden are not actually moderate in the country. They're just more friendly to business interests, more friendly to the status quo stuff like that. They're not at the center of the country. That brings but them if you closer actually had, to the middle. Yeah, sorry, go for it. Well, that brings them closer to the middle. It's not like Republicans aren't pro-business and pro-economic elite. They're more so No, but you Democrats. see in situations like um, West Virginia, you know, we talked about like this a lot with Joe Manchin because people will say, ah, he just has to be conservative because uh, West Virginia is conservative. But then you look at polling, you're like, yeah, they're conservative on a lot of issues, namely uh, social issues, but a lot of economic issues are actually super progressive. So they call themselves moderate to get away with keeping the status quo, but I think the center of the country is very willing to Look, do I'll, some change. I'll just, be, I'll just be a bit more direct here. Um, Go for it. I think that for interpersonal conversations, it's very important to adopt certain rhetorical approaches to make people feel like they're understood and to address their concerns. I also feel like we're on the precipice of a genocide. And I know looking at history that your approach has been ineffective to say the least. Would you have told the Jews back in 32 in Germany that they shouldn't be calling Hitler evil because they may yet convince some 
moderate-leaning Germans? Of course not. You would understand that past the point, you just need to ferment as much radical opposition as possible. What we're living through right now is an era of unprecedented partisanship, and there just isn't that much evidence to indicate that on a broad scale, we're going to pull the Republican Party apart. The QAnon-believing, January 6th defending, Trump really won the election-believing Republican Party apart. What we can do is socially stigmatize them, and that is an effective form of rhetoric. After the Civil Rights Act was passed and Dr. Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., was killed, uh, most Americans didn't like the man, um, thought he was too radical. We didn't make people and make social life less racist by calmly debating the issue or reaching out or being bipartisan. We did it by shaming. Um, I think it's high time that the perpetrators of a, of a potential genocide be referred to as what they actually are. This liberal hand-wringing has not brought Republicans over to us. Okay, yeah, they I'm, are I'm evil. Not your, They're murderers, you know, and I think it's okay to tell people that. If that makes them go out and buy guns and ammo and prepare for a day where they try to enact that genocide, then all better for it. Guns are already in this country. I would rather okay. them be in whoa, the hands whoa, of victims than victors. Can, yeah, lots of stuff to respond. Uh, first of all, I know in comparison to your language, I'm going to come off naturally, which I hate, as the pro, uh, like, bipartisan, boring liberal. That's definitely not actually my positions. I am sickened every time I have to hear a person in power, like, get super turned on by the idea of pointless bipartisanship and all the type of stuff. Um, that's not what I'm talking about. There's a big difference between heavy shame and uh, trying to socially stigmatize certain I ideologies. And understanding, as of now, the block of people who truly believe those things, like we're talking about right now because of the mass shooting, the Great Replacement Theory, how Tucker Carlson's talked about that, and you know, lo and behold, uh, in this guy's manifesto, he's talking about it, and a lot of people believe that, but I think it was like 50% of Republicans think there's some strategy going on to replace voters. And if there's a block of, even not even just the liberals, no, li don't you agree that liberals are a part of our movement? Because otherwise, you're the people you classify as actually uh, a part of the movement that you're a part of is so tiny. Well, they're not part of my if socialist movement, and they can't really be part of an anti-fascist movement either unless they're actually willing to act on it. But they're not but able to act on it. I think liberals are the easiest people to bring in. Well, mm, are it's not easy, but. That's what of I'm the trying to do. are going to be the easiest people to bring over into anti-fascism. I agree. Liberals need to be dissuaded of their weird, uh, ahistorical, paternalistic delusion that fascism is something that civility will work us out of. They yeah, need that's to be not buying guns either. and operating militantly. Well, okay, that's what well, I love to do, by the way. Liberals need to be afraid. There should be afraid. We're at the precipice of a very difficult social situation. Their Don't fear you think that that's needs to be politically incredibly effective. exaggerated. You're, so what? Um, wait, what is? Yeah, the uh, we're about a genocide is about to happen, and we need to all go get guns and that right be ready there to get is why we're not a part of the same group. No, we're literally like if you look at any like lead up to a genocide like charts, like where are you here, 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 like. It's not ambiguous. Those charts weren't written by leftists. I mean, we're at the point right now where, you know, um, right-wing media is coordinating to condition their audience to think of all queer people, or even people with colored hair, Jesus, as groomers and pedophiles, which is a clear element of dehumanization, which leads up to legal uh, oppression, which we're getting through uh, currently, right now, unstopping, and following that you know so here's the big the big difference though that is not something that even uh a large portion of everyone who's to the right of of me um believes in fully almost I every single care. person I talk to and if you look at polling but you should care because for a genocide to they don't have be to believe it on the horizon there has to be a you know significant portion of the country that has enough people in power that could uh, make that happen. Wait, they do. Whereas right now, the major vast, vast look at any polling on any LGBTQ issue, uh, vast, vast majority of America is very not on board with, with the Weimar violence. Republic like, was the most progressive place in Europe before the Nazis took over. Republicans in 2024 are probably going to have all four branches. Well, three branches, four seconds: uh, the presidency, the Senate, Congress, and certainly the courts uh 
if you don't think they'd be willing to just start, you know, uh, 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 engaging in full stop legal oppression, uh, like their messaging for decades, they've been signaling this. Well, oh, I mean, what do you think the lead up is? Suicide? Huh? It, I agree. There, I mean, you look at, you know, I'm in Texas and the law that, uh, or that Greg Abbott tried to do of uh, classifying gender affirming care for children as child abuse. That's legal oppression 100%. Is that what you're talking about? The legal oppression precedes time? other behavior. Okay. And it, do you then, sincerely not believe, like, do you think the obsession with, degeneracy in America, the belief that there's an effete elite group of liberal or leftist academics that are controlling our children, and the belief, the popular belief that non-whites are being brought into the country um, in order to replace the white population, in tandem with the Republican Party signaling that they're going to attempt another coup if they don't win, but they're probably going to win and hold all houses. This isn't something which you think merits a sufficient degree of alarm on your part? Oh, a hundred percent. I'm a hundred. I mean, look at my own content. There's tons of things to be alarmed about and it's exactly what you're talking about. But, uh, one of the things that I think you did do a very poor job of, um, conveying and okay, let me finish what I'm saying, but then I'm, I have a question as well was you didn't at all divide until maybe the very end of your video between politicians and, and voters. And then went on to talk about uh, political violence, build our democracy, kill them, and then he pauses him for a long time. It was like socially, you know, politically, um, and they wants to the Republican Party, the modern Republican Party wants to personally murder every minority that lives within the border of the country, and then tell people to get guns. To me, that's expediting some sort of huge violent clash between two groups in the country, but not at all moving us faster towards squashing the fascistic element of the movement. You squash fascistic movements by winning the violent clashes. Hmm. So your political plan is to prepare for a civil war and then fight it. I don't know if a civil war is the right word. There's certainly going to be violence in this country during my lifetime. And if there is going to be violence, then I would prefer the people with the better morals to be the ones who are appropriately armed and prepared. But my right actual now, guess is that there's going to be an increasing divide between red and blue states, and that with control of the federal government, um, Republicans are going to attempt to impose federal law to control the blue states, or, because they can't control it with state law. Um, blue states, some of them will refuse, and then there might be clashes between state guard or police. You know, some police might try to enforce it, but like others will say like, no, don't do that. There might be attempts at ousting. Remember during the Black Lives Matter rallies, you know, there were like those Patriot Prayer dumb fucks rolling their, you know, $60,000 trucks through like urban neighborhoods with a bunch of guys with guns in the pickup trucks. When that happens, I want people to be able to take shots at them from apartment windows. You know, I don't want them to just be victims here. We have to be ready. Hmm. What state do you live in? You live in the states, right? Texas. Texas, hmm. yeah. And Austin, you better be so... buying guns. <laughs> I'm not. It's easy there, ain't it? To me, there's a huge difference. What did you say? It's easy there? Oh, to get a gun, yeah. 100%. Um, the amount of people who are willing to conduct any sort of violence right now as opposed to people who sort of like a person who watched Tucker Carlson is like, oh, I kind of, I kind of like this stuff. The Great Replacement Theory, yeah. But we're not seeing this mass movement of people. Uh, it's still very fringe to me, of people who are like, I want to conduct violence. And Doesn't so then for us on to. our side to be like, okay, it's time for us to be getting guns and preparing to uh, shoot each other down the streets. Well, first of all, the right's been doing that for decades. This whole, they're going to, feds are going to take my guns, we better arm up. They've been getting ready for decades, so we got to catch up. Second of all, it doesn't matter if they want to go doing any shooting. You know what's actually going to happen? Police are going to try to do it first, and then they are going to support the police. You know, go look at any genocide in recent history, past century. The way you think it plays out ain't how it plays out, you know? It's not like a bunch of people vote or like there's a poll, how many of you want to kill the minorities? And like 50% say yes, and then they go start doing it, you know? There's a 
a creeping assimilation of political power as the right ramps up genocidal messaging against minority groups, accusing them of being the weakness within the country that's tearing them and civilization apart. Um, then you see like uh, right wing militias acting alongside like police units to enforce unofficial or official legal restrictions against certain minority groups or left leaning areas. This has happened before. And by the way, that militia group shit's already happened, ain't it? Um, DeSantis recently didn't he try to form like some Florida His own home? state guard? Yeah, yeah. Wonder like what he extra. wanted that for? Yeah, one makes you wonder. Right after an attempted political coup. Why would one of the most right-wing governors in the country, maybe the most, who's gunning for president in 24, want essentially a private army? <laughs> Obviously, it doesn't operate exactly as a private army, but, you know, he's played it fast and loose with the rules before. Man, we need guns. And it's defensive, too. I'm not talking about initiating violence. I'm only talking about making sure innocent folks can defend themselves when they come for them. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think right now public opinion is in a place that the way we can defend ourselves from all of that is by grabbing power and being like a fun little movement of online people who scream about, uh, well, no, that's not how I would want to say that, uh, who's just screaming about preparing for a huge violent clash is not, does not have broad appeal. And we need broad appeal in our movement to have any chance of getting power. One of the people I think about a lot is uh, Bernie Sanders, obviously he sort of, came out of nowhere in that first run and did pretty well, didn't win, obviously. Um, but one of the things that was super notable about him, he definitely conveyed his views. He's definitely very, you know, raises alarm about uh, the anti-democratic stuff with uh, the Republican Party, all of that. But comes off and in his rhetoric comes, like, he could be a moderate dude. Now, of course, the media pretends that he's super radical all the time. But there was a lot of people that I knew who generally were usually saw himself as the center and they're like, oh, Bernie's kind of cool, even though he was the most um, left candidate. And I think if generally as the left, we and online progressives, we adopt messaging that it has broad appeal, we could very, very easily get in power and do the actual uh, foundational things that will prevent them from being able to enact any of this type of stuff. Because that's what we need. I'm telling you, a bunch of Vashites fighting against a bunch of like, proud boys it's just, it could definitely happen in the increasing rhetoric on either side currently, but that's not going to save us from a fascistic takeover. I don't we think definitely you... have to get enough actual political power. And the only way you do that is to have broad appeal in your movement and not just sound like, oh, see, there's radicals on the left and radicals on the left. On I don't right. think. Because our, our policy prescriptions aren't even radical. Maybe farther down. So they call us radical uh, either way. Mind. They call Biden People radical. understand the difference. People call Bernie radical. Exactly. And it didn't work with Biden. They'll call it, you that. But if it lands on people, is it a different thing? Republicans have called Biden a communist. I don't think my rhetoric, this is, this is where with respect, I think this is liberal brain rot. I don't think acknowledging that you should arm yourself in preparation for a genocide and that the people who want to kill minorities are evil is an optical harm. I think you're falling for civility. No, politics. But I'm saying that I'm not. Okay. In my own. Okay. You have to understand that a lot of people who aren't, uh, I don't like using this because I know Destiny has like a thing against online lefties and it sounds like you have a obsession with it. Um, and I'm not super, you, super obsessed. Do you with think it's a crazy online, lefties, online but wait, 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 lefty thing let me, to arm wait, wait, let me, yourself in hold preparation? Up, hold up. Just let me finish the thought. Okay. I, my point is most people, even who consider themselves liberal, who are a part of our broader movement, definitely don't think of the Republican Party currently as being preparing to slaughter minorities. In That's the what street. I want to say. And so when you say that, people go, uh, well, then ex you have to explain it in a way that comes off as sort of logical. The way that you explain it is as if you're just as, even though because I've watched you, I know you're not, so I take it more seriously. But for someone else who hasn't, doesn't have that underlying understanding of kind of your thought process, then it definitely comes off as just as kind of detached but as I talk I talk to my audience right but I've about. explained my rationale dozens and dozens of times about the necessity of forming strong neighborhood based political blocks whether you're leftist or liberal this isn't about socialism here this is just about building communities that aren't going to roll over when authoritarians try to tear apart our democracy I don't like I, I, I the the thing is to me like you are the one more out of touch with America than I am here 
because you're the one who flinched when I said you should buy a gun. You know, I'm in touch with Americana here. Now, I, I saw. I'm in touch with Americana everywhere. here. Guns are. Why shouldn't <laughs> we own them? Dozens of them. Thousands of rounds of ammunition. Gun, um, Armored. I didn't flinch. Armored vests. I am very un, un, uh, shocked by what you're saying. So don't, so don't worry. I my think feelings aren't hurt. I explain my rationale well enough. The precursors to genocide, what leads to it, that's a broadly recognized thing, not just some crazy lefty theory-based thing. The issue with liberals right now is they don't understand the stakes, you know? Liberals should be treating Republicans as what they actually are, evil and immediately threatening. Now, you can talk with them all you want. I love talking to folks. You saw that convo I had with the uh, LDS person last night? Friendly convo. Um, I don't want to, you know, it's not an intrinsic thing. Bring Republicans over. Save them from themselves. But this, the threat right here, it's what we faced in Germany. By we, of course, I mean the progressive left and everyone else, by the way. It's that the belief that this type of political movement can be squashed by anything other than militant, aggressive political action has failed in the past. So that's what we need to do. We got to bring liberals on board. They got to own the guns. They have to be practicing at the ranges. They have to be treating political organizing with the same sense of fatalistic engagement that Republicans do. You know, we need people out there as crazy as the Republicans in those school board meetings. We need them showing up to all those local town hall groups. We need them that. to be psychotic. Uh, uh, you know, break the law. I don't give a shit. Don't hurt any innocent people, of course, but be wacky, you know. Throw some bricks. Don't care. They need to put the fear of God in Republicans. No, we're talking about the, the greatest country on earth, the God-given U.S. of A., and preventing you... the takeover of fascism. This, this is the line? And we have... What's the, what, what do you mean? The, the union organizers in the turn of the 20th century were out there, like, warring with the police and getting neighborhoods bombed. But that right there, like, precursor to genocide, throw a brick, that you flinch at? Like, this is the issue here. I'm not saying I'm going out there and, you know, doing somersaults on cop cars myself. Obviously, I know, you know, I'm an indoors boy. But we just need that level of energy because there are liberals. But exactly, you just get out there. Right there. Everyone is indoor people there is no one except for republicans like, aren't very very as far as people who are willing to go out and enact violence this is not a mass movement whatsoever a bunch of people want to sit and scream about the damn de degenerates in elementary schools and a bunch and of people, the people on the left want to scream about how fascistic the republican party is and without the people doing in power will do and it i think if you spend all of the energy that you want your audience to spend getting <laughs> trained at the gun range and you know going to self-defense classes and everything actually organizing which obviously even in the title the scream you're or the stream you're helping to do with canvassing and all that but if that was the focus we have public opinion on our side we but could I do both wash this movement but no you you can't do both you there's can. no broad appeal to a block of the left they running do both. around saying hey you know how you're really scared of the right because they seem to be uh, a little bit into violence and have a bunch of guns and everything, we're going to do the same thing. Good. Get Hooray. them on board with it. Like the way moderate Republicans are with, with their it. radicals. Wait, no, you're telling me it's impossible when Republicans do this. Republican fascists are advocates for violence and they're incredibly aggressive electorally but because they know their leaders the will enact it for out of them. Everything. That's what it's so upsetting. It's like Tucker Carlson is so obviously saying that white people are being replaced by black and brown people but then the way that he says it is never in that exact wording because he understands for a broad audience to like it he has to at least code it a little bit and then the more radical friend goes ah we know what he's saying they don't and so it. 30 hmm? percent of republicans believe that violence might be necessary to fix the direction the country is on i'm sure there are far fewer liberals as a percentage who would believe that if i am to be one of the left-leaning people who will openly advocate for that then let me be that person if the Republicans can survive 30% of their group thinking it might be necessary, I'm sure that the left can survive me believing it might be necessary. I just don't think it's an optical harm, you know? The only people who complain to me about this, by the way, are like hand-wringing liberals for the most part, you know? Or that, that LDS guy from the other night, um, he said he didn't like Trump that much. It's usually people doing the, um, cons not concern trolling, because that implies you're being disingenuous, you're not. 
uh, the, you know, like concern from the side. I know what you're saying because I get upset with the same people. And, and I'm picturing like uh, Nancy Pelosi talking about, you know, wanting a strong Republican Party and all that nonsense. I, I, I know the person that you're picturing me to be, and I need you to understand there's something in between. Uh, oh, that's so scary rhetoric, and we need to lock hands with the right. And what you're talking about, which is, all right, it's war, baby. Let's go. Um, uh, you have to defend yourself against violence. Do you think that's uh do you think like um a black right guy now, from the 1960s would like shirk if I said that? Like, you should own a firearm because there's a decent probability that far right violence will be inflicted against you. Yes, do you think that'd be like an point. out of nowhere thing for but them to hear? This is that's a beautiful po point. What about or, or by bringing that up? How did we actually win on the civil rights question? We, and like you said, there's a little bit of walking and chewing gum. But what was successful in pushing for that uh, political change? If you think I'm against the passage of law to support our case, then I'm, I'm, I am in support of that. But that was something. First of all, obviously, a lot of outcomes didn't change after that. And there was quite a bit of militant violence at the time. But and, you know, it's also worth pointing out that one of the only reasons the Civil Rights Act was passed was because there was so much agitation within the country that was exacerbated by people who are very like me. But yeah, I am glad the law was passed, though that was because they were able to pass the law. What can Democrats pass? And there is a well, they could pass a lot of stuff if they uh, beat uh, Mansion and Cinema into submission. Well, they would still need to get rid of the filibuster, which a lot of them seem unwilling to do. Right. Which, that, if they lose, I'm with you on that. We're not. Well, we're yeah. about to get to the primaries, which we're probably going to lose at the very least. The Senate tie, possibly the House, and after that, the presidency is probably a coin flip. Because the loudest, the movements that are, uh, obviously they have their crazy base. Okay, boom, they have them. What happens when have, the Reds win? And they, and they keep them, what was the question? What happens when the Reds win? When the Republicans win, what do we do then? You're gonna just, you're not, tell me you're not going to respect rules of law passed by them if they entail the oppression of minorities. Like, you'd go like, well, they won the election, so they just get to do that. <laughs> of course not, if it was... You know, unconstitutional stuff, which no, no, no. About, definitely would Wait, be. they have the Supreme Court. It's constitutional. What are you going to do? My point is, okay, yes. If it if it was a law that I understood as wrong, I would be against it. Morally wrong, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, what would you do? It's, it's the, okay. It depends on the specifics of the situation. Well, let's, okay, about, like, let's say let's say like, let's say they pass a very anti-democratic bill, like they've been doing in states. There, there's not much. I'm not going to go out and start shooting Republican politicians because they did that. Whoa, whoa! I didn't say that. I would. It would be uh, legally hey, unwise for me to say that. Say of course, that. no. I would never advocate people do that. Um, but let's say they in 2024 have the House, the Senate, the judge, the the court, and uh, the presidency. Okay, and let's say after they have that, they do start federally passing undemocratic laws, which they can do uncontested and, in fact, absolutely will do. Okay. And you see, law by law, democracy being eroded. So, what do you do? You know? Now, I'm not, you, it's, it's a little again, rhetorical. Again, we have, a, well, I'll answer it. We have, especially in that situation, because here's, again, you go to me. We tried liberals, um, and it, it didn't work. Republicans are about to win. But you understand as much as I do, true progressives are not in power right now. And if that's what we are fighting for, I think progressivism has a very popular appeal. And if we dominated in power and undid, you know, any bad things that they were doing and destroyed them. Now, I know what you're saying. If you're but unraveling democracy, 2024, it's a hard to the, in power. What, the outcome I'm describing where they control like every element of government isn't an unlikely one. I think it's actually more likely than any other possibility. And they've been pretty openly anti-democratic for a while. So once that happens, if they start passing federal legislation to make it more difficult for Democrats to win in the future, whether we're talking like big redistricting or they full on ban like uh, mail in voting and then like restrict laws about intimidation at the voter place because they know their white boys are going to show up and keep black people from voting in Atlanta, whatever crap like that, you know, what do you do? Because you're not going to win in 2026, right? Like they're, they're so preventing you from winning on in that. 2026. The first thing, the first thing is... 
definitely just I don't, I don't know what you would how you would answer that so i guess you can answer afterwards because definitely any form of violence isn't going to make it better it's just going to have more justification for them to uh, crack down even harder the second thing is we've seen already there's tons of anti-democratic type laws in place and you it can be overcome and we saw with and then the, the last point i'll make and i would love to hear you answer what you would prescribe uh we definitely aren't to a place yet where even the Republican Party, as crazy as they are, feels like they can do on a federal level a certain level of wacko crazy stuff or else they're going to lose public opinion completely. Trump was in power and still legislatively, what crazy stuff did they do? Just a really dumb tax cut bill. I mean, he, uh, he never yeah. lost public opinion and nothing he did ever lost him any public opinion. Ever, like every crazy thing he didn't said, his his support right, was unwavering. Okay. Republicans don't None care. None of that was Re foundational, you except could, for at the very end. You could be executed on live TV by Trump himself, and they would all vote for him the next day. This is what I mean. That no, you're just wrong. No, you know how? I, no, how I'm not. No, I'm ab no, I'm yes, you're absolutely wrong. not. His <laughs> approval so, rating. So dumb. His approval rating did not. Move. You're wrong. No, right now. Do you remember what, how do you low know? it was when he left office? And it know? wasn't that low. Amidst Republicans? Of January 6th. Amidst yeah. Republicans? It and where is it right now? I mean, it was still really high. I have no clue, but really high. Yeah, it's uh, very high. Plus percent. They don't care. Republicans do not care. And if you really <laughs> think they wouldn't. Okay. Do you, wait, do you, wait, hold on, hold on. Do you really yeah. think, because you keep saying stuff to me, which c indicates that this is more of like an emotionality thing, not some Absolutely. principled understanding of the political That's system, because you said the, um, the Republicans aren't at a point where they could pass some crazy stuff that could influence the democracy. The Republicans- and still win a federal election? Correct. Th they'd already won the federal election. The Republicans can do whatever they want if they hold all three branches. It wouldn't matter what the voters mm -hmm. cared afterwards. Okay, so- yeah, you're saying that the hypothetical you posed to me is because the way you laid it out was like they did more stuff like they've done in states, which we could overcome that in the next election if they did, if they mirrored what they've been trying to do on a, on a state wide. But if you're saying they got rid of democracy federally, of course, obviously now it's time for a revolution. Okay. But so, wait, so it how do you, people to so, vote. Yeah, so wait, okay, how do you, so at that point, mm -hmm. like, when? When what? They, there's not just going to be an anti-democracy law, you know. <laughs> um, that's my point, though. In let's say that Trump got back in uh, got back in office, so he has two years, and he and he kept the House and the Senate. Which, if they got in power in 2022, by 2024, if they could keep that power, that's a whole other question. But let's say they did. Okay, all three branches held by Republicans. What you're saying is they're already in power; they can do whatever they want. And I'm saying. They know that if they do, if they go too far, they will lose public opinion. That's why Trump lost because he sucked it up a with bunch, Republicans. In a bunch of different ways. No, they don't care about mainstream Republican opinion. They care about the opinion of their constituency. But the, just the base support it. The base supports everything they do. Yes, agreed, a hundred percent. But if, that's if, not going to win them an election. If American democracy is hinged on whether or not you believe the Republicans will continue to vote af for Republicans after they attempt to undermine our democracy? They already did. Republicans uh, are yeah. going to come out just as strong in 2024 Undermined, despite the coup. No, no, you said they're in power and so they can, all, they can just, boom, do whatever they want. You're never going to get in power again. I'm saying for them to keep the layer on top of their base that allows them to win federal elections, because their base is not enough of the country for them to win another federal election. But if they did stuff that would turn off this uh, block of people, it won't they matter. They'll have already won. Right. Okay. So then you're saying that means in two years before the next midterm, you're saying they would pass stuff that would actually pretty much kill democracy. What midterm? You, I'm saying if you, if they, the, 2024, 2026. What midterm? You, I don't think you understand. And this is why I use the rhetoric that I do. We're up. Time's up. They attempted a coup in the last election, and they still believe it was right to do so. We're already in the point in the history books where it's getting near too late to do anything. You're talking about, well, 
If they revoked our democracy in 2024, by 2026, the Republicans that have supported everything they've ever done up to this point would suddenly lose faith. No, Tucker Carlson will talk every single day and night about how anti-democratic it is that it's not possible for Klan members to protest outside of voting booths in black neighborhoods. They will talk endlessly about how the new wave of preliminary voting is an attack on our democracy and so on and so forth. They'll talk about how new redistricting laws are necessary to preserve the foundation. We won't get another chance here. And the problem that I have, you say, if they get rid of our democracy, oh, then we have a revolution. You won't know the democracy is gone until eight years after it was too late, because we're already right there. The clock's ticking to midnight, and you're talking about how the moderate Republicans wouldn't vote for them after they ended democracy. This is what I'm concerned about. You need to be more like me. You Okay, stop. Stop it. That was very inspirational. I'm Obviously not depending on a certain, oh, I really hope that Republicans all of a sudden wake up. No, that's stupid. I'm saying that as we saw in uh, 2020, 2020, when the Republicans stray away from broad appeal too much, they lose. They have, you know, record turnout, all that good stuff. What we haven't done is effectively legislate or effectively be in power and I do get your point a little bit of like walking and chewing gum at the same time, but the only way that we can pressure the politicians slash get new politicians who will effectively govern so that majority of the country goes, well, obviously we want them in power. What did Trump went on in 2016? Um, he, okay, obviously there was a tons of bigotry that he spoke to, uh, all that type of stuff, but then there was a big portion of people who supported him because they thought he was anti-establishment, going to bring back our outsourced jobs, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Why? I mean, it was pretty much, that was definitely a part of it. He didn't do anything to that effect. He didn't really do anything. And then after the presidency ended, the Republicans still support him. He ran mostly on the wall. He that lost, was like though, That was a big part of the Muslim ban. He got more votes in 2020 than he did in 2016. And Biden got more than that. Yes. So what happens when the Democrats don't get more than the Republicans, because the Republicans have only ever increased their support. You keep saying, if they do something crazy, moderate Republicans will lose support. No, they didn't. Trump had four years to act like a lunatic, and then more Republicans voted for him. Democrats well, this is my only point. have to they, lose they, once. He, this is why Democrats, like a... Democrats don't stop fascism. They abate it temporarily. They're like a wall that you build. Because no, they're we not need a radical, to... progressive You're not movement getting it. revolution. You're but not, it's not getting it. Okay. You're getting bullets. It. You're not getting a progressive revolution, okay? Bernie lost. We're if not think, getting progressives in the House okay, and in the if Senate you in 2022. honestly think that it's more likely that we can get a mass movement of people that overrun the political body and get in power and squash the Republican, the current Republican uh, movement for good, if you think that's less likely than getting a mass movement of people ready to clash in the streets with far right wingers. I'm only saying we have to be ready off, for when it does her. happen. And if you, and by the way, again, you think this okay, is a mutually, everyone, you yeah, keep sure. saying this is a mutually exclusive thing. It's it not. Is. No, it's not. Because no, stop. No matter how much yeah. you may believe it, the delusion that you can be, you can either be electorally effective or like militant, but you can't be both is just wrong. Republicans have proven it wrong. Democrats in the past have proven it wrong. It's not true. You can vote. You can advocate. You can be electorally effective. Go appeal to the moderate centrist base. But I'll tell you what people vote on. They vote on fear. More than anything else, people vote when they're afraid. That's why Biden got so many votes, because they were afraid of Trump. And we need to start putting the fear of fascism in people in this country. You want electoral effectiveness? There you go. That's how Republicans get their vote. Tarker Carlson talks every night about how the country is going to die at the hands of immigration. You want people brought over in voting blue? They need to understand that it's milk toast liberal Democrats or a boot on their neck. I am both militant and uh, electorally effective in this respect. And if more liberals were, we wouldn't have to worry about the Republicans because they'd be treated like the radical brigand group that they are. But instead, no, liberals go, oh, no, if we defeat them, their ideas are bad. And sincerely, if we understand that people, you know, they'll be moved over by our arguments. No, they won't. Nothing exactly, you and I say will move Republicans earlier, over. earlier the civil rights movement. Don't you think that as a person existing in the 1960s uh, or 1950s, that would 100% be a time where like, wow, we could be 
headed towards something really bad. A really large portion of this country wants us to be suffering. That was like the era of militant leftism. So I don't know why and, you're, you're bringing that up as though it's a counter to my argument. And what squashed that movement, not for good, but what squashed it and what got lasting change was a movement that had broad appeal. And I guess what you could be saying, and I could agree, I guess we could come to some agreement. For me, the way that I think about all of this is, you know, like a broad progressive movement. And maybe what you're saying is the role that you play in that movement is making a certain portion of people who identify as progressive understand the potential violence in the future. I think a lot of people understand. It. I think that if I, I think if I could have a conversation with an average American, like an independent, you know, like uh, maybe, think, yeah, what sorry, are the Republicans work. doing? Everything they do, it's a lead up. You know, it's very clear what they're doing. You can have a convo with them, put the fear of God in them. I can't make them like Democrats, but I sure as hell can make them hate Republicans. And the Republicans deserve their hate. They do it. They earn no, it. This is what's going to happen. Okay. Every single person who isn't exactly where you are is going to, Look, because I've I met so many people recently who are watching the current uh, Republican Party and they're like, oh, that's terrible. I don't even, that's just, what the heck? And if they turn and the king of our movement is Vosh and he's like, you know, they're demons. And dude, some of your rhetoric was 100% what I see right-wingers do when uh, like dog whistling for violence. Like uh, Tucker Carlson's thing where he says, they're effective. why wouldn't a dad go in and hit an LGBTQ teacher or whatever? Well, the critical difference uh, there is that he's encouraging violence against LGBTQ teachers, and I'm talking about fascists who are trying to kill Right, LGBTQ and if I had to pick people. one, I would pick yours, because yours is somewhat defensive in nature. Somewhat? But when if, wait, is, is defensive somewhat? In nature. No, listen, wait, before you go off on a big thing, I'm saying that the way that you portrayed it, of course, when you lay it out like you just did, okay, we're just waiting for something crazy to happen, and then we'll be ready. Uh, the way that you laid it out in your initial video was like not explicitly saying go harm people, but as close to that as I hear other people doing. We and so while the underlying logic is definitely defensive, I think encouraging people to violence in general is something that we don't want broadcasted in our movement because a lot of people are going to see that and go, okay, that's also too radical. <sighs> and that's when people get complacent. But when you offer an amazing alternative movement um, that a lot of people can get on board with and it isn't fascistic, people will join that. And that's what, as sad as I am to say this, because obviously I don't working. think he was an ideal candidate, that's why Biden won, is people were like, whoa, Trump's crazy. And they turned and Biden, even though a lot of it was just, huh, 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 offered a pretty good alternative vision. Nope, you're completely wrong. People voted for him because he was the most electable candidate. He won if he because was also people saying were afraid crazy, wacko stuff, of they would Trump. not have gone in and vote. You, he won because people were afraid of Trump. People weren't voting for him because they were excited about what he had to say. It's because they were terrified of another Trump presidency. And the problem with the, what you're talking about right now is a self-perpetuating issue. You know, liberals are terrified of the realization that they share this country with monsters who would have them killed. Well, that's tough, but we have to grow up. It has to, we have to learn that and fear motivates and it's legitimate fear. This isn't like a uh, Tucker Carlson fear mongering where he makes shit up so that his billionaire masters can get away with another tax cut. This is like climate change type fear, real stuff really happening. People should be afraid. They should act in that fear. We've been trying to get people afraid of climate change for years and years and years. And you know what? We've done a terrible job of it in large part because a bunch of people in this country think that it's God's given rapture and they think opposing it is, uh, you know, sacrilegious. Um, but also because liberals just aren't cut out for the fear game. They're weak and spineless and made of jelly. But it can be improved. Mm. It's possible to improve. You know, the French resistance in World War II wasn't just liberals, or sorry, it wasn't just leftists, it was liberals. It was centrists, moderates even. They were united and a hatred of fascism, and they fought and they died um, to, well, irritate the Nazi occupants. Um, we need that energy. Uh, we, we, if, if, if we're going to concede this, like, well, people aren't engaging with this, you know, they're going to kill us rhetoric, then we're already dead. Um, we need to... Because um... that's not something that 
then make it. Then make Anyone it appealing to them. Make them see. But there has to be some factual basis to there, it. And there is. There and that's is your not problem. Factual basis yes. to a mass killing of Americans. Do you, uh, do you know how you genocides know, happen? By the, by the Republican Party. There is. Do you know how genocides take place? We're already at dehumanizing language of degenerates who are being convinced and groomed into their degeneracy by an elite cabal of economic... And it's the Nazis. Times, how many times have we seen that uh, language that didn't lead to a geno genocide? I'm sorry, do you know how is long that, people have been getting called degenerate? How, do you know how many precursors there are to the current wave of anti-LGBT media attention and legislation? Because we have the 1980s, which was when Reagan let hundreds of thousands of gay people die by preventing the CDC from doing any research into AIDS. So that was a genocide. The last yeah, time so this happened was a genocide. Even in that moment, we would have been farther from pro or further from progress if the backlash to that was... I actually don't... I'm still unclear on... Okay, actually, this is a great question. That happens. What is the Vosh response to that? Because you kind of got like, oh, no, that's not what I said. Whenever I, uh, I didn't make, mean to make your voice sound annoying there. Uh, whenever I said, okay, so go kill politicians. And it's like, no, of course not. It's defense. Well, then what, in that example, if that's a genocide, what is the response that is more um, revolutionary? What are you trying to do? Get my channel banned? When people <laughs> are being in killed. Your, in a dog whistle When people, that's not a dog whistle. When people are being killed by the hundreds of thousands, do you seriously think it's unethical to use violence to defend yourself? Do you really think that's unethical? Would it have been unethical I don't think for the it, Jews to fight I actually don't think that? it's unethical. I think it's... Uh, okay, you bring up that example. That's a, Of course, in that situation, we can see how violence not only is the only option, but then also could lead us to where we want to go. I'm asking you in the example of uh, AIDS in the 80s, is that going to take us forward in the most effective way? Your, if you commit um, hard enough? Ethical, even if it's ethical. If you commit, of course it's ethical. And if you commit hard enough, anything is possible. I'll ask you, do you, so, you know, do you think, would you have been chiding the Jews for fighting back in, say, 31, even if you knew through some prophetic ability that their attempts at fighting back would have been ineffective? Because it seems no, like you're only telling me that self-defense is justifiable if you can know the future and know that it will work for sure. It's possible that there's nothing we can do. This might be a pointless conversation. It's possible that the, 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 the dominoes have already begun to fall. We're not going to stop Republicans from winning and no amount of violent counteraction is going to prevent them from overriding our democracy. It might be too late. So at this point, I've seen decades of liberal messaging and centrist, oh, bring them over, shit fail. Uh, I think we're, I just think we're past that point. Uh, I think we're at the point now where we have to recognize. There's never been an actual progressive movement that like a Bernie-style progressive movement that uh, rose up thus far. We're, it's too late. We're, in 2024, that's the next election. We don't have time for progressives to win, to take over the Democratic Party and win the House and the Senate it's and the presidency. Alarmist. Of course, we should be raising all of the red flags, but that is, there's no way in which people being ready for violence, the only thing that's going to do in... I mean, I'm okay with people getting a gun in case something ever happens, of course. Um, oh, there you go. Second Amendment. Bosh, you're killing me. You think I'm someone that I'm not. Um, but there's not an outcome that I can see that has been explained in a logical way where we express our ambition to conduct violence if needed, and that helps us win the election or something. Or it helps us after, after the election, you know. What, why, why is this being framed in electoral terms for you? This is about life and death. You, about, you just asked 2024. 2024 is done. We've already... 2024 is a coin flip. Maybe something happens between now and then, but whatever outcomes are going to take place from direct action aren't going to have a significant impact in 2024. I'm talking about what happens no matter who wins that election. Maybe a Dem wins 2024. Maybe we have to wait till 2028 for this to be relevant. I don't know. We're probably going to lose pretty hard in 2022, though. So that's going to be... We're not going to get anything done, even if we win in 2024. 
But eventually, he they're going to get a hold on us. They've been redistricting like hell. Every single time they undo something, Democrats don't have the power to redo. Uh, you know, we need to be ready. And I have to ask you, just out of curiosity, mm -hmm. when in Germany would you have said violence was okay? I'm definitely not familiar enough with the timeline, so I can't give specifics. Um, but obviously I do think violence was justified uh, at certain points. Like, at a certain point, it definitely would have been. But, for example, if I were to make a comparison, because we didn't know the future, if when just racist things were being said about Jewish uh, Germans, mm -hmm. if Jews started going out and just... Again, I'm not clear on even what you're... What about arming up? Is. Wait, hold on. I'm just saying getting ready. Up. So all I'm only saying that's getting not ready. not at all what you... Okay. No, mm -hmm. that's what I'm saying. Getting ready. Oh, perfect. I'm totally okay for everybody to get a firearm as long as they are very safe with it. Well, sure, they shouldn't be unsafe, but that's not but an exaggeration. The, Getting ready me. for to defend yourself. That's what I've been saying. So they can do that. What about um, when the German government started passing laws of restriction on Jewish people and businesses? Like specifically designating Jewish people as a separate legal category alongside dehumanizing rhetoric in order to... Um, in order to categorize them separately and and uh, you know limit their movement, you know oppress them in a variety of ways. That plus dehumanizing language plus hate crimes start to rise against them. You know, in that environment, because that's where we are right now with trans people. That exact point is where we are in that environment. Do you think but it's unfair the, yeah. to go like, yeah, you should be like ready if they come for you, like they are getting ready for something, and you need to be ready. You need to arm yourself. Um, again, I already said I think it's fair to just say everyone, you know, be ready for anything. But in the case of trans people... For anything. Seeing a very... Uh, but that's not the focus of your commentary. Your commentary isn't like, uh, just be ready in case anything happens, but be super safe. It was like, let's go. It's They want us all dead. That was one of your quotes. Do you think it would um, be inappropriate for the Jews to have said that back in the early 30s? They they want us dead, the Nazis want us all dead. They were right. I don't know I don't know the specifics of the build up to uh World War II well, enough to compare it to our current situation. Well, the Night of Broken Glass happened in 38, like a year before the war, you know, but the the mechanisms for the Holocaust were laid well before that point, you know. 33, 34, the, the, you know, you have a political party in power. You really telling me back in like 34 or whatever, when all the precursors I've described to you were in place, they were saying something like, yeah, the Nazis are evil, they want you dead. And you would go in and say, hey, come on. You really think you're going to convince Nazis with rhetoric like that? Like, you know? And that's a great, that's a great thing. That It's nothing like, or not nothing. It's uh, not equal to what we're seeing now because like in the case of trans people, uh, increasingly, people are totally on board. And I can tell you every single person that I've talked to who has like a an icky belief on how we should be treating trans people in society, it's from being misinformed on what is going on. Most of it is like, oh, I'm really scared because I think that little kids are going into class and teachers are saying, you're not a boy, you're a girl, you're not a boy, you're a girl, until they turn into a girl. Like, that's what they thought about explain, the Jews. Oh, no one's advocating for that. And right now we have public, we have the people on our side. And then there's this fringe that's same in Germany. Wacky and Germany, needs to be was, Germany was a very progressive place before, uh, during the Weimar Republic. Not as progressive. You're saying as that Germany wasn't. You're saying that Hitler and the Nazis were not a popular movement. No, the Germany uh, Nazis only had initially support of like 25 to 30 percent of the population. They seized power anti-democratically, and through seizing control of education and the means of propaganda, they convinced a larger and larger group of Germans of the general political aims, misinforming them. Some of the stuff they'd like to say about Jews were that they were effet intellectuals who would corrupt their children through degenerate messaging designed to destroy Western civilization. It was not a popular movement to begin with. They seized power anti-democratically. You know how many people are Republicans in the U.S.? About 30%. Everything is set up. And the Germans and the Nazis were not 
any more intrinsically anti-Jewish to begin with than modern Republicans are against trans people. Maybe you can convince one or two or three or four, but every night Tucker Carlson speaks to an audience of millions. I'm sorry, at a certain point, look, maybe everything works out, but past a certain point, not saying you need to be ready is just irresponsible. Okay, and I already agree. You can totally say you need to be ready. Your, uh, what I am kind of addressing is very different than just you need to be ready. But I do think, um, even in the case that you're talking about, I hate doing this because it's like the most extreme case and mm -hmm. definitely a uh, lack of knowledge there. But if early on when they started slandering Jewish people, if there's a bunch of Jewish people who started enacting violence or, or kind of promoting really violent rhetoric, even though I think it would be justified and moral, I don't think even you would believe that would have helped them. That would have caused it all to seem more justified. And that's why I'm well, really scared about um, going around saying Republicans are demons and human flesh. The Holocaust is then happened to anyone anyway. who's like a little soft hearted liberal is going to be like, oh, that seems so crazy. Like, I definitely don't want to be a part of that I mean, movement. When the Holocaust happened anyway, you can't really go back in time and be like, well, if you'd been more violent, a second Holocaust would have, like, the Holocaust too would have happened. Um, no, actually, I think that something would have changed have if Jews that. back then um, had simply armed themselves and then killed all of the Nazi party, you know? And there were attempts to do that, but I mean full-on, kick down the door, gun them all down, you know, maybe they get arrested okay, again, or executed. boom, you just said it. Okay, Whoa, but, killing but Nazis? Right now, Wait, are we not... against killing Nazis here? I'm totally on board. I'm saying... Right there, you're making a comparison. So then, Whoa, and you I've made nothing. This is Whoa, what you wanted. I have made oh, no allegories <laughs> in this conversation. Okay, what's an allegory? I, uh, no, sorry, no comparisons, analogies, none whatsoever. But yes, what? Uh, That's the what we're Jews... talking about. We're comparing. Yes, you. No, okay. we're not. No, I, we're. I, this is this it. is uh, unrelated. There, uh, the the <laughs> the Jews might have been successful in preventing yeah, their okay. own extermination. And, Wait, do you agree? Wait, do you agree? Yeah. That while they're facing Government. legal persecution, an anti-democratic party is seizing additional power. The Jews, say 33, 34, if they had hatched some plot to gun down Hitler, Goebbels, you know, some Nazi upper party meeting, say it's like uh, Inglorious Bastards, they get invited to a theater and all just get gunned down in the final act, something like that. Would that have been wrong? Might have stopped the Holocaust. Morally, and World probably War II. not. But if, again, we're talking about how this can be compared wait, 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 to wait. our current situation. No, Morally, no, stop, I'm talking. Do you, you think just, it would have been... No, Vosh, but, but would, stop, it, would it have talking. been practical? Because it would have killed It doesn't leadership. sound... Okay, if, if you think... If they could have effectively um, wiped out all the Nazi leadership, then maybe practically, yeah, that would have done something. But I don't think right now... Because the comparison you don't want to make now that you said that is... That's what some progressive group should do to Republican leadership. And would I even imply that? So <laughs> let's say that. Then what in, are we talking about Germany? Let's for? say in Nazi Germany. So uh, the assassination of political leadership is a very effective way at destabilizing a political movement. That's, that's so just. So then make it. So then apply it to our current situation. Well, Go. wait, hold on. I'm just trying to figure out what your threshold is for the Nazis, the ones that we can talk about. Okay. Mm -hmm. So with the Nazis, <laughs> you know. Uh, we have the precursor to a genocide being constructed, you know, these people are evil, they want Jews dead, blah de blah At what point, you know, because the, the, the alt-fiction, what if, like, a resistance group had killed Hitler before the Holocaust, this is something liberals have been jerking off to for almost a century now. When would it have been acceptable if that assassination had led to destabilization, internal tumult, and then eventually, like, a restoration of democracy? It would have been messy, I'm sure, but better than World War II. Again, it would all depend on if, if they pass, like, I'm not familiar with the timeline, but if they passed a law that's hurting, you know, Jewish businesses, like you said, Jewish individuals, and all of a sudden, like, but it's the practical thing. If you could actually magically wipe out all of, all of Nazi leadership, you think it's um, like impossible? Maybe that could be ethical, but. Do you think it's impossible very, to Very, like, very difficult for a, a small, small minority to wipe out a governing 
um, body. There, there are examples all the time of a government seizes power and then shortly afterwards the leadership of that government is killed by insurgents or radicals or by a con conflicting faction and then there's an internal power struggle and someone else takes power. I don't think anyone worse than the Nazis could take power. That's pretty much like the worst. <laughs> That's about as bad as it gets. So whoever would have taken power afterwards pr probably wouldn't have done the Holocaust and probably wouldn't have started World War II. Or at the very least, when those things happened, it would have been a, like a well, much less. The other thing too is, um, from my understanding, you can correct me on this. Hitler was much more of a soul leading force that constructed this whole movement around him. Um, and so I do think practically, if you could have gotten him, maybe no one else had the specific ambition to do, um, you know, mass genocide. Well, you had a but cult they still would treat them poorly and all those type of things. Uh, we do, but if you took out Trump, which practically... Whoa, 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 whoa. If you... I don't believe in political it, violence. Come on. No, we don't. Sorry. Uh, agreed. Um, I, I think if, that both of them were about comparable in the extent that, like, there were other political forces that wanted power, and through him they were able to achieve it because he was, like, a popular. My point is, even if like Trump a, decides not to run, we'll say it that way, if he decides not to run in 2024, there's still a whole movement separate from him. There's so many individuals who could lead the current MAGA movement um, well, I'm, I'm without Trump a part of that. Talking about Whereas, Germany. Right, and so then I'm... Stop it! I'll, I'll stop with the uh, possibly, you know against TOS language. I, no, I no, no. I, I just, because you have to be in the ground game, right? We're in the ground game right now. Right now, we have the benefit of looking back on the Nazis and thinking, oh, maybe if this chess piece had been moved here. But if you were there, I mean, at what point do you get to thinking, wow, the Nazis are really bad and they're not going to be dislodged through any kind of civil protest. Um, we should just kill them. At but what you point... Yes, okay, but you have to understand um, th there would be a point I would need to, first of all, it would be helpful to have been there, but then also I would have to, for this conversation, read a lot more into mm -hmm. the things that were happening to tell you where that yeah. line is. But if we could get away from that, because mm -hmm. what I'm concerned with right now is the here and now in the United States, um, what is it that is all, again, I feel like your language was similar to the language people would maybe use feeling justified in the example we're just talking about in Nazi Germany, but, and it was similar to what we're talking about here in your rhetoric, but then I feel like where you want that rhetoric to go is not at all equal. And so then it's kind of like, okay, well then if all you're saying is, hey, maybe you have the right to bear arms, get a gun just in case. Well, okay, that's kind of boring. I want people- I'm, I'm fine with that. To- But I think all of our political capital and energy and uh, what we should be broadcasting is a, Ra a message a of fear revolution that's progressive but and non terror. We're not going to get the ideal political leader, but we do have the ideal enemy. So we should be focusing on them. This is what the Democrats don't understand. Republicans don't talk about what they want to do. They talk about what the Democrats are doing. They get people motivated through fear. And Democrats only ever talk about their own positions. Oh, well, we want to do this, that. Nobody cares, and nobody gives a fuck about politics. So what they could do care way about better with political marketing, 100%. With but terror. Also deserved terror. But this you, isn't but lying. We don't have to lie. They definitely fear-mongered about Trump, for sure. And not I, even close I'm, to in enough. In a good way. And not... Maybe not enough, but not enough. they don't just talk about what they do because they don't barely do anything. But Biden didn't even talk about Clarence Thomas, the uh, his yeah. wife. Yes, because Biden is so a far pussy. up the, uh, like, Washington Club booty hole that... But of course he doesn't want to speak out. That's what we've got. Business. Yeah, that's, well, that's what we're dealing yeah, with right now. And that now. is so far from where, what I'm talking about as well. We're both very far from that. And you're trying to group me in with the no, Bidens. No, no, no. I'm not saying like, you're ideology. just like him. I'm sure you're far farther left than him. I'm only saying that we're not getting the ideal progressive candidate with the ideal progressive message and the ideal progressive party to back it up. All we have right now is this shit. So I can't convince people that Biden's great. I just can't, but I can convince them legitimately that the Republicans are dangerous and I need people to fixate on that and I need them to be yes. armed and I need their communities uh, armed. Yeah. No, see, this is, you don't understand no, because exactly. you're, no, 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 this is American exceptionalism. You are of the opinion that it can't happen here. It can happen. No, I'm here. not of that opinion. No. I'm saying what's and the when effect, it, most effective way to prevent it? When it does, you can do both. 
when it does, there's nothing mutually exclusive. You Republicans, can't because Vosh, the Republicans I, with the armories are also the ones who vote and go to their local school board meetings. They're they are not uh, mutually exclusive. The most but, militant Republicans are the ones who best serve the party. It's not mutually exclusive. And nor am I. Our movement, I'm a you, warrior first for Biden. Of all, you do understand that the right and the left very different in what appeals. Yeah, the um, left is worse. The right understands yeah, that fear and violence are the ways that you control a political uh, and group. When you say you can do both, it's just like, but we can't. Because if I'm talking to my audience, you know, same size as yours. Um, no, if I'm talking to my audience and saying, hey, here's some other people you should go watch that we're trying to, you know, unite with. And I suggest you, a lot of my audience is going to be like, what the... Well, then, some of the stuff. Then let them with. die. Okay. Then they will perish. This? They have to be but strong. We're not going to be in power because now we don't have large enough of a movement to foundationally prevent what's going to happen if, because we're split among like people who are against violence, you know, in their mind, and then you and that kind of ilk. And then we don't, we don't, we don't have large enough of a movement are to... are wrong in believing uh, that people and power. rhetoric like me are harmful to our coalition. Fear is what got people to vote for Biden. Yes, fear, but they don't want to feel like they're as bad as the other side. Everyone feels that way. You can You're fear not. monger a lot. No, no, stop. You absolutely should express to people how dangerous the Republican Party, um, especially certain elements of, of it, are. But if your rhetoric sounds a whole lot like theirs and what you want to do, now that we know there's a lot of things to be afraid about... This is an aesthetic concern. We're not going to grow a... That's like your entire job is your aesthetic. It's a it's a fleeting aesthetic concern. What we sound like them because they th say that they need to go and what kill or legally oppress trans people, and I say trans people need to defend themselves against their oppressors. If no a one's liberal, calling to kill. If a so. if a liberal hears those two things and sounds no difference, they deserve to die. Uh, when the but when you're the gonna fascist die mob, too, you're gonna you die too. You're gonna die too. Listen, because your a liberal wasn't big enough to actually get in power. And a liberal it. You're is gonna be a worthless. Fun little friend on the side with your guns, and you're gonna be shooting at people. And you're gonna stop. Die. No, so, stop. I, I have been exceptionally patient, but I'm going to lose it now. <laughs> Do you it. You continue to believe that civility politics is a necessary component of marketing to liberals, and you are doing this by perpetuating the fact that liberal civility politics is necessary to speak with them. If your audience would be turned off by the belief that you should be able to defend yourself against fascism, change That's your audience. That's not what I'm talking Sh about. No, you don't understand. You That's not think at all what, what I'm, you are I'm taking issue with. What you, with you. Are, what you believe is that it harms us in any way to engage in the kind of defensive rhetoric that Republicans have been using successfully for decades. You have fallen for it. You are a psyop. You believe, they're telling you, they're whispering in your ear, yes, don't tell them that we're going to kill them. Don't let them believe they need to defend themselves against fascism. You would only hurt your movement by doing the thing that we've done successfully. You're falling for it. You're co-intel pro, my friend. Not really. I don't want to be accused of making these accusations sincerely. But it is frustrating. Independents will be moved by the rhetoric they hear. Republicans have moved a lot of people with theirs. It's time for us to wake up realize and we don't have time fucked. our rhetoric is fucked because we don't spend enough time no. fear-mongering <laughs> i said it sucked um yeah be yes uh, i totally agree with you fear does drive people to the polls all that type of stuff so what do we but say you have to understand that uh i think you would agree that agree to this too the reason why we don't stay in power is because on the campaign trail democrats do a really good job Who's of we? i have never been in power they, they fear <laughs> yeah yes obviously um i'm talking about the current Democratic Party. The reason why they get taken out of power is because they don't actually do a lot or materially improve people's lives a lot or anything. And then, like you mentioned, they're not great at effectively fear mongering. Um, but in the example of the Trump Biden election, there was a lot to fear monger about, obviously, in the middle of COVID and all that type of stuff. And then Biden did have a pretty broad appeal in the message that he was. Because I know you're saying it's not all fear the reason why uh you're able to get in power is fear plus something that they can also grab onto and if all it all it is is like hey come join our movement because we want to kill them and they want to kill us it's like uh, it's not doing anything and i think we've i mean i don't know i feel like we're just running in circles
I just to me there yeah, is sorry. no mutually exclusive element here. And the only reason people on the left and center are turned off by my messaging is because they haven't been introduced to enough of it yet. So introduce it to them more. Get them more familiar with it, okay? It's not my fault that the Democratic Party has made it their mission to coddle and weaken their voters to the greatest possible extent. And now you have millions of Americans, these embarrassing, you know, urbanite liberals whose best response to everything the Republicans do to undermine democracy is we'll vote harder next time. No, you won't. You're not going to get to the voting booths. You're not going to get a chance. No political body is effective or relevant without a plan for how to deal with the end of the democracy that their party exists in. The Republicans are ready and waiting. Where guess, the fuck are we? You, we don't, for people to even have a chance of sticking around for more than a minute, listening to like that type of rhetoric, they have to believe in the, um, like the foundation of the building that you're building. Because, and, and by, by that I mean, they have to believe that democracy is going away. I don't feel like we're doing a good job of expressing that. They have to believe that there's actually this bloodlust on the right, which and I don't think enough. But that's my point. I don't think there's enough evidence to prove to people then that you're the a right stooge. is to kill people. No, you keep saying kill you haven't people. Presented you have a child's sir? understanding of how genocide takes place. I a encourage very smart you. Child, then. I encourage you. Yes to look up the history of Nazi Germany, because it was apparent from our conversation that you don't have any historical allegories for how genocide takes place. You, you seem to be that, waiting on the let's kill people comparison. bill. Uh, okay. Even in the example where I was up front with, hey, I don't know the timelines, so I can't give you a line. In that case, you also, that's a great thing to talk about. You haven't defined where the line is in either cases, really, and how that compares to our, our current situation. The line for what? Violence. Violence started the moment the declaration was signed. What I'm talking about isn't a beginning to violence. You won't... It is a beginning to the defense against violence, which has taken place. We live in a system built by violence, political violence. When cops mm -hmm. enact laws passed by political agents acting on the behalf of their corporate masters, they are acting violently. What we're talking about is social violence, social violence against minorities, sometimes legitimate, sometimes illegitimate. Is it done through the purview of acceptable legislation or is it done targeted to hit them? It's difficult to say, but what's happening right now with this LGBTQ bill wave across the states is pretty unambiguously unjustified, a very deliberate targeting. And this is how, this isn't how it starts. This is the middle point. We're okay, well this into is great. it. Let's focus in on this. Let's focus in. So with the LGBTQ stuff, this is my point. If you go to anyone and mm -hmm. you read them one of the bills and you say, this is violence, it's time for us to get ready to fight them. No one's going to be on board with that except for a very, very sure. small percentage. Fine. How about the legislation that says that there would be attempts to violate the Interstate Commerce, uh, commerce Clause and uh, press charges against any person in the state who left to go to another state to get an abortion? I forget for which abortion. state that was. Um, if you take a look at that, not only can you not get an abortion in your state, you're going to be charged unconstitutionally if you I get one in a different state. So essentially, you get raped. Uh, and uh, you're pregnant two months, you now have a choice. It's Texas? Texas, apparently. You now have a choice between having an abortion in Texas illegally and hoping you don't get caught or getting charged after you do it in a different state. Now, you really think if I walk up to this person and say, hey, they're coming for your rights. They already have taken half of them. Do you really want them to get away with taking the other half? You really think that's not a resonant message? Oh, it 100% is. And then you say, and that's why we need to get ready to fight them in the streets. And then you give them then a, go, oh, no. Wow. Then you say, as little then, you say, then you say, hey, they are literally arresting people for miscarriages. You should probably arm yourself. You should go there and probably get to know your neighbors and make sure that you're familiar with your community so that if the cops ever start doing raid checks to make sure that everyone who is registered pregnant still is, you're ready. If you think what I'm talking about right now is illegitimate or unreasonable, the black community did this throughout the 1960s, and they weren't all waving their little hands at the indignity of it all. Plenty of communities have done this. The queer community has done this. The trans community was probably more armed back in the 60s than they were now after Stonewall, when the very public attack on their, um, on their little, um, you know, shindig 
uh, uh, became like the subject of national discussion. What I'm talking about right now is the behavior adopted by minority groups under threat of persecution all across the world. But what you think I'm saying is they need to start goose-stepping across Main Street in little packs of 12 with their rifles, getting ready to shoot out with cops. I'm not. They just need to be ready because things are only going to get worse and it doesn't hurt to be safe to know your neighbors, to have a gun and know how to use it, to stockpile ammunition, to stockpile food and water, to stockpile everything that you could need, to be fully aware of the fact that democracies have failed in other countries, and they can fail here too. There's no reason it can't. Nothing can keep it from not happening here. What will you do when democracy falls? The Republicans are ready. They have armories. They have a political party that is not only ready for, but currently enacting the end of democracy. What are Democrats? Democrats, oh, we'll get them next time. Democrats, they're not going to do anything. You have to act for yourself. You don't have the central messaging to rely on like they do. When the, when the democracy fails, Republicans will be getting their updates from DeSantis on like, you know, how many children they should be killing that day. We will need to be figuring out how many, not children, <laughs> we'll be needed figuring out our own stats. Uh, without direct leadership, because Democrats are not set up in such a way as to orchestrate that kind of post-democratic system. Hmm. I hope you will excuse the hyperbole in there, but the underlying <laughs> message was, yeah. was something I sincerely believe in. All right. I, I literally, as I listen to you, I just start preparing to say what I've said a million times, so I don't feel like there's much else. It doesn't just think, hurt. Yeah. Do you think you... Do, if, you know what doesn't hurt? You do, what... The, how you expressed it most of the times in this conversation where you say, because again, I don't agree that you could get many people to um, believe in our current situation that that is about to happen. Like why, the, do, um, why does half the Republican Party think white people are under threat, despite there being zero evidence of that fact? Well, okay, but what they're believing What's is... What's different? Why uh, do they keep getting would, away with it? Well, they're saying, hey, because like white people's percentage in america's decreasing over a certain number of years that's what they and i have nothing i can point to like. hundreds of state bills they need no evidence at all for their entire party oh, to get behind oh, the, the idea they're I, under attack no, to be clear i'm not saying like oh they have actual evidence i'm saying what they're fear-mongering about they're not saying uh they're coming to kill white people I they literally they have successfully the with no evidence convinced a significant portion of their political party that white people are under threat. If you look at polling done on conservatives, the most oppressed group that they refer to in America is consistently white people and conservatives, like 40 and 50 percent respectively, whereas right. black people and women are like eight to nine percent. They are they are completely on board. Tens of millions of Americans that they're under attack right now, and they do buy guns and they do buy ammo off of what? Changing demographic statistics, which don't hurt any of them. But I can point to hundreds of anti LGBT bills passed in half a year, and that to you is not enough to convince a liberal that they're under threat? Sorry, I read something. I just looked down. Um, I agree they're under threat 100%. We both agree on that. You keep saying stuff, and then I guess it's well, just we need more to convince them, and they need to that. arm themselves like right. Republicans and I, have. I think our two main components. I probably disagree with you on how you message mess message the way or the extent to which they're under threat, because I think giving a really honest, factual kind of laying out of what's going on. And expressing that to people and then saying this is what we want to do is the way to do it i think i think I'm saying factual. that i think you're factual but i'm saying like the average even person on a liberal who hears see what they're doing to these different groups they're about to start killing them uh they want us all dead i think most people go oh okay well he's yeah. kind of like the other people who why does the average conservative disconnected. go for it then why does the average conservative require they don't so believe little? That. If they don't believe that um, liberals are going to kill them. They, the belief that the liberal establishment is going to kill them is literally a mainstream Republican belief. Like QAnon being one thing and all, but like the idea that like, the, literally like conservatives have long said stuff like it, they want you dead. Least, I am borrowing well, their well, messaging. I'm just right when I use it. Okay, And they again, believe it and they stuff. act on it. Right. Why are liberals so weak? Why are they unwilling to act righteously where Republicans were 
for less evidence act uh, uh, unrighteously? Why are they so much more active and willing, even when they're wrong to do but so? But they're successful for their movement because they never explicitly uh, let the... Yeah, they do. Go on talk radio. They the say more... insane shit on talk radio. Wild shit. There's less restriction, fewer restrictions there when it comes to, uh, you know, what you can get away with. They say wild shit. So then um, do you feel that your, that your job is different from every, like, I guess when I say stuff, it's, um, Call assuming me that I would want, what'd you say? Call me Vosh Limbaugh. <laughs> exactly. Or is that, no, like, do you think you play a role in, uh, doing something in our movement, but it not being everyone's role? Or do you genuinely believe like what you um, say, at least in the videos that we're kind of responding to, is something that pretty much everyone on the left should be advocating for? I don't think everyone can advocate for it or should advocate for it the way that I do. But I think like the general messaging that I'm disseminating about getting ready and preparing and owning a gun and knowing your neighborhood and stuff, I think that every single person who is like farther left than Biden should be doing that on their messaging. Hmm. I want to see that shit on MSNBC. I know I won't, but... Yeah. Because I, I, there, there are tons of people the second that they... They're on board. I mean, they would even get on board with Bernie, but the second they see they hate violence... Guns. They're spooked by guns. Another reason I right, hate Democrats... Right, so if you're just saying, hey, just in case uh, is why you hate what? Another reason I hate Democrats. It's like they've oh. been spending the past half century deliberately grooming their voter constituency into being the weakest, most vulnerable to fascist group of babies in the universe. Lots of problems with the Democratic Party, but um, I think you maybe just don't... If you just want like your little, your kind of group of people to be ready... Everyone. It has to be everyone. Assembly. Well, it won't then. Okay, I guess that's what... Then we no didn't try harder. Then get into content with... creation and, and say this. And I'm saying I'm in content creation. I'm saying that if you... You have an, a shorter path from where we are now to winning power than getting all of these liberals to want to do, do a violent revolution. They're, you can do both. Can and I didn't say violent revolution. I just said neighborhood defense. You've said that a bunch of times. You know that. Not in this convo. Isn't I haven't like used gold? the word. No. Oh yeah, maybe not in this combo. And re realistically, by the way, you know, in terms of actual insurrectionary efforts, like to, to put aside all the memeing, I don't actually think they're really possible. Um, obviously, like, you know, Jan 6 aside, the idea of any coordinated political violence actually like cutting the head off of a political establishment in America would be basically impossible. It's just not something that can really be done. Also, there are so many subsidiaries and backup systems to like ensure that the presidency would continue moving forward, that it wouldn't actually like it would be largely ineffective. The most useful thing that you could actually get armed leftists and liberals to do would be to hold out their communities when civil fighting takes place between militia groups and local um local neighborhoods um, following any kind of conflict between federal and state legislation. So the best example of this would be if the federal government passes some radically oppressive rule that a progressive state government doesn't want to follow, and there's conflict within and without the state as to whether or not that law will actually be followed, that conflict will lead to pockets of insurrectionary activity and lawlessness where right-wing groups, militias, and probably cops will work together in order to effectively secure areas under like de facto martial law. And in those environments, Environments, it is kill or be killed. And in those environments, I hope my people have guns. And by my people, I mean 250 million Americans who don't vote red. That's mostly what I'm talking about. And whether or not they win in those pockets will play a large role in who wins over the state government. And whether or not the state government succeeds in resisting the federal will will determine whether or not some broader action has to be taken, like sending in the military. But the military is majority Democrat which makes me think they would try to stay on the side of any internal conflict. Plus, sending U.S. troops to resolve internal disputes has always been kind of a tetchy issue politically. That's what I'm really talking about. So that, so that right there, that's the actual, like, in my mind, loosely what usefulness there might be to being defensive um, in, in the context of, like, the end of democracy here in the States. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. Makes sense. General think... belief. I honestly, I understand. I've talked to a lot of people who, uh, you know, understand that for a while the gun kind of balance was way tipped in the Republicans' direction just because that's kind of a big Republican thing and guns, really. And apparently, gun ownership among liberals, I think, has gone up a lot. 
recently and hell yeah brother it's not like i not something i'm hugely against i think the only to kind of summarize the whole conversation is you're saying hey i feel like we're headed towards this and to be prepared for that this is the rhetoric i need to use and i'm saying hey i feel like we could prevent this uh but we won't be able to if people think our movement represents or is represented by your rhetoric and that's kind of the summary and you think you know you're a little a little wuss lib good I think the idea that militant groups have been electorally harmful to their general side in America have largely been overstated historically. They said that about the Black Panther Party as well, and they were wrong, of course, uh, to do so. Um, I wait, just wait, I, can I you say what you just said? Like I, they they said the same thing with the Black Panther Party that their militancy was going to throw people off the civil rights movement and was going to lead to more conservatives and anti civil rights legislation fear mongering, and they were wrong. Uh, it turns out that racists who didn't want the civil rights movement to pass also would just accuse Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. of being militant. They didn't care. You know, the whole civility thing was just uh, a mirage thrown up by uh, people concerned trolling uh, or, or well-meaning liberals, who, of course, Martin Luther King roasted in his uh, letter from a Birmingham jail. Um, the whole, you know, putting a timetable. But that was an issue, right? You know, the whole, well, Don't maybe... Don't you think that if... MLK's rhetoric was like the same as you know that certain aspects of the Black Panthers then he never would have rose to prominence like he did because part of the reason he was so effective at pressuring um like LBJ and stuff is because he had a larger movement behind him than just like a sliver of the population I agree he had a, a larger lot of movement which included people like me diversity of tactics you need to have people like MLK, who are politicians, and he was, certainly, at least in his affect, capable of delivering messages in a steady, calm, and uh, even-handed way. And you need people who put the vice on. The Republicans understand this, again, because there are crazy-ass QAnon types with a disproportionate amount of power, but they're not the ones who write the legislation within the party. Um, and likewise, I think that we need people who are, you know, strong advocates of you know, political togetherness. And I think that we need people who, who put the squeeze on a little bit. And I think that right now the Democrats are 100% in category A and 0% in category B. And I think that it should be, you know, I don't know, I don't know, 50-50 or 70-30. It, it has to be something that's not 100 and 0. Hmm. Well, okay. I, I like do appreciate the conversation, been... by the way, even if it got heated. It's been a very good one. Oh no, it's been awesome. I love it. Uh, can I ask like a completely random, possibly bothersome question? Sure. It's completely off topic. So I also watch your good friend Destiny, mm -hmm. of course. Um, and one of the people he's been bringing on a lot is this uh, Mr. Girl character. Mm -hmm. And I saw you did that debate with him. Mm -hmm. What? I'm really confused. I feel like I'm going crazy. when I, He's like, you know, just popping off getting more popular, talking to Destiny in line. Usually Destiny seems, I probably think he's more reasonable than you think he is, but, um, but to me, Mr. Girl is so obviously like, I don't know, promoting some bizarre ideas. Like whenever y'all had your debate and it was like, hey, under the umbrella of, we're having an open conversation about people possibly being attracted to, um, other people who are under the somewhat arbitrary line we've drawn is like the legal age or something. And he used that as a justification to get a little bit descriptively creepy and stuff about like, hey, let's fantasize about young girls. But he's not being treated like that and it's confusing me. Have you experienced that at all? Because I know you didn't have the best thing or have you gotten more fond of him? Uh... I definitely would put it that way. I haven't really consumed any content of his or seen him at all outside of a video done Mr. Lalanda, old man Lalanda or something like that, which talked about how he's like an abuser to his girlfriend and a pedophile and bloody blah, blah. Um, I don't really know the specifics. The impression that I get of him, old man Landre, thank you, is that he's a legitimately bad person in a bunch of ways. Um, but he's not stupid, and he knows that he can monetize that by leaning into it enough that his behavior comes across as self-referential and ironic. So it's a really common strat for, like, sexist people to, like, 
they actually do kind of dislike women, but they'll make like over the top sexist jokes in a way where it's like, oh, it's a joke, obviously. But, you know, well, does he actually think like half of that or whatever? With him, I don't know what the relationship is between X and Y, but it's basically just a rehash of standard conservative. I'm joking. I'm not joking shit. It comes across as like really, really weird to me. Um, but he, he, he seems to be pretty genuinely like a pretty scummy person. So, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. OK, good, because. <laughs> uh yeah, I think there's this new wave of, hey, there's a lot of these social norms that are, and, I, and a lot of this is good. Like we've talked to, you know, we've talked about, you've talked about, and I've talked about um, a lot of the stuff around gender. Like, is this all necessary? All of these boxes and gates that we form. Uh, so then there's, especially on the left, kind of a movement of let's question norms and expectations and push the envelope a little bit. And it's interesting because that's all what kind of his thing is is hey you know how everyone's really uncomfortable with pedophilia well let's talk about it and like we should be able to be open about these conversations and to me it's like yeah we should without having to get into like a weird fantasy thing so anyways okay that makes me feel good um no you're you're not alone in feeling that way um i do i mean the the whole it's it, again it's basically like the i'm just asking questions right so like when neo-Nazis want to advocate for their positions, instead of like outright stating anything normatively convincing, they'll just ask like leading questions that try to bait you into certain like discussions where you have to like talk about their moral premises without them having to assume any of the positions you have to argue against to express your opinion. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's pretty standard stuff. I don't know. It's it's pretty weird. <laughs> we've, we've done this song and dance before with Amos Yee back in like 2018. <laughs> Were you around for that? No. You look younger than me. He was, he's a Singaporean <laughs> guy. He was friends with Sargons of, Sargon of Akkad. He was a ah. not pedophile who very adamantly argued about how the age of consent was oppressive or whatever the fuck. And then he got arrested for CP like a year ago or something. So, you know. Oh, and did he talk to Destiny? Yes. Funnily, Destiny yeah, was okay. one of the people who said, this that. is bullshit. The skeptics are giving cover to this pedophile by being buddy-buddy with him and not taking the argument seriously. I will take the argument seriously. So... And in, right. In, okay. Yeah. You know Sorry. the 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 grand the gra the grand scales of reality. You know tilt um uh, ever ever more um in in someone's favor, not mine certainly. Uh, but yeah. Anyway. Anyway. Um, I uh, I it's do like appreciate the, the convo. Yeah. All right. There we go. Uh, <laughs> absolutely. Thank you so much, sir. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And bye bye. See ya. I feel like you guys were too mean. I actually enjoyed that conversation a lot. I also know there are going to be people in my chat who disagree with my perspective, so I'm happy to answer questions from anyone who disagrees with me. Um, obviously, stuff like this, uh, you know, conversations like this, always come across as a little bit, um, how would you put it? Um, a little bit speculative. Hey, Shu. A little bit speculative and a little bit um, kind of abstract in a LARPy way. Um, it's just, I, I, I feel like the idea that something like that could never happen here is really just a product of American exceptionalism because it totally, totally can, you know, not only, not only has America come very close before, but we, you know, we we inspired the Nazis and our eugenicist prescriptions. There were huge supporters of, of fascism in America before World War II. Um, you know, of course, like stuff like this can happen here. And um, I really, really think it's it's politically important for everyone with a good perspective, you know, to 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 realize, like to understand, like, yeah, I want to solve this within a, a democracy. Uh, but if democracy should fall, something we need to be ready for that. And right now, our other political party is anti-democracy. So. Wait, what is, what is White saying? Wait, SDL wants to talk? Chilean leftist chatter wants to talk to you? No, if, if they want anything to say, just DM, just DM it to me on Discord, and I'll just, um, and I'll just read it. What did SDL want to talk about? My love of guns? Do you think you might have jumped the gun a little, getting down his throat, ascribing every lib position to him? It felt like for a lot of the convo you were attacking him for positions he hadn't expressed just because you labeled him lib. The only positions that I ascribed to him were about his, um, his, his, his sort of 
aversion to the acknowledgement of violence as a, as a sort of pre-existing or omnipresent factor um, and, and his like just aversion to it rhetorically. It just comes across as civility politics to me. The threat we face is very, very real. And I want it known, by the way, you know, it's not like the fascists would like America after it goes fascist. Do you think the life of the average rural Republican is going to get better if the, you know, the Trump imperium is put into place? No, of course it won't. You know, obviously, everyone, at least almost everyone, who is our political enemy is the victim of propaganda that they were probably introduced to at a very young age. A lot of them were literally groomed into being fascists. This isn't about opposing them on a fundamental or intrinsic level. However, keep in mind the argument that I'm making right now could apply to literally any group of people ever, and I don't think you would argue against fighting against the Nazis because the Nazis were victims of propaganda and so on and so on. Unfortunately, um, while conflict is unfortunate, if it is unavoidable, it is morally preferable that the good guys win. And sometimes they can't really win uh, when, they, when they're pacifists. Lots of stuff. The essential point is that Republicans have asymmetrical polarization and we don't, which matters for how people react to violence. Yeah, STL, I'm aware. We need to work on that. See, this is a prescriptive judgment on my part. I genuinely do not think that liberals as, an, as, a, as, a, as a block are going to be useful or relevant in the coming years at all, unless they're willing to get on board with some of this stuff. Um, it's, 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 it's necessary. Um, to bring them over. We will. I don't know why he kept saying that I, I didn't want to do anything electoral. I just, I don't know. Historically, I don't think there's that much evidence to the idea that having like more radical advocates for progressivism, leftism, or anti-fascism um, like meaningfully detracts from the more mainstream left-wing political cause that much. In fact, I usually think there's an assistance there. The disconnect is that you didn't convince him we're on the precipice. He just doesn't believe we're as close to the edge as we are. There's no real, there's not, I'm not going to like list like several hundred bills or whatever. I, like, I, I don't know where I'd have to go exactly to move him on that point specifically. The point that I'm trying to make is that no matter how close we actually are, we're closer to a real threat to ourselves than Republicans are, but Republicans are able to be convinced that they need to defend themselves to protect the democracy or America or whatever. Um, that's a multi-decade process. No, soaked and left. History moves quickly, my friend. We don't have multiple decades. We have several years. Electoralism is fucked. We're done. We're donezo, folks. All we get with Democrats is we, uh, we hold the line a little while longer, which is what we're going to be doing with canvassing, by the way. Holding that line gives us incredibly valuable time, but that's all it is. Time. We're only buying time. Republicans are explicitly anti-democratic, and every year that passes, they do everything they can to subtly tip the scales of power more into their hands. When next the elections arrive, on every level, local, state, federal, judiciary, whatever, it doesn't matter, they are working against us, and the Democrats are weak. They're spineless. They're made of jelly. They are not capable of defending us the way we deserve defense. So we can't trust them to tip the scales back the way we would want them to. We need to explore alternate solutions, whether that be radical action or direct action or preparation for self-defense or hell, all of them. It is something that needs to be done. And I don't like the accusations of uh, dog whistling because I have never dog whistled. I make jokes, but my positions have always been incredibly clear. Everyone is in favor of political violence because everyone supports some kind of political violence. Um, people just draw the lines at different points. And I have always been a radical advocate for self-defense, a position that I'm proud to take unashamedly. Uh, and, and I, by the way, I have to say, I do think it is remarkable how evident and how, no, how self-evident my position is, because when you analogize it over to the Nazis, all of a sudden everything becomes clear. You understand what I mean? Like, in America, you know, it's all very this and that, but if, you, if you're like, okay, well, what, so take all these things that are happening right now, but at that point in the Holocaust, like right there, and it's like, oh yeah, of course then, set video games where you're a resistance fighter gunning down Nazi soldiers. To, like, 
all of a sudden, radical in retrospect, passive and submissive currently. Very bad strategy for winning any kind of political battle. Why don't you dog whistle more? I don't need to, I'm right. Also, there's nothing wrong with advocating for self-defense. Everything that I have advocated for in this stream has been perfectly in line, not only with my and everyone's moral code, but with the legal rights enshrined in the United States Book of Laws. Uh, we all have a right to self-defense. We have a right to gun ownership. I'm perfectly happy to advocate for those things. I do regular whistling here, no dog whistling. I don't need to dog whistle to advocate for self-defense. But you were Pepe posting about implied active violence. All violence we enact in our cause is defensive because everything that I have said throughout this conversation has been, we should prevent a genocide. In that context, everything that I say is in reference to the concept of political self-defense. Um, active violence implies that we are the aggressor or the initiator, which is, under the current set of circumstances, virtually impossible. You know, the shooter in Buffalo thought he was acting defensively. He thought uh, when he mowed down 10 people, innocent people, in a, um, in a supermarket, uh, that he was acting to defend the white race, a blah -dee blah the advocacy for defensive action uh, is, is by far the, the, the ubiquitously applied uh, standard for, for justifying any kind of violence. There is a critical distinction, of course, uh, an important one that people will often overlook, and it's that I'm right, we're right, and he was wrong. White people are not under threat by immigration. White people today uh, enjoy as a product of immigration a higher standard of living in almost every imaginable way than they would otherwise, and whatever ways in which white people suffer now that they did not a century ago are not a product of immigration. It is a clean sweep. Or as my advocacy, uh, uh, my belief that we are under attack, is demonstrated in the explicit and unambiguous intended behavior of all the people uh, who legislate from the Republican side. So Vosh, if immigration was a threat to white people, um, would he be right? A threat to white people in what sense? Like a threat to white people being able to eat at Arby's? Because all the Arby's got closed down? No, a threat to white people is a deliberately ambiguous statement. If you were to say white people were under threat of genocide as a product of immigration, then sure. Uh, and meanwhile, while we're in fantasy land, like, no, of course not. Real genocide, by the way, not white genocide. What was that thing Sean said in his video? Um, white, white privilege must be real. Whites even get the nice version of genocide where like nobody's hurt. There's just like more brown people in your country. No, no, you'd have to justify the real harm there. Um, and significant enough harm and also, and no other avenue is available or possible. I agree, deism, but it's too late for this round. Even if the white replacement theory stuff was right, who cares? I know a different skin color. Well, the white replacement theory is like the malicious attempt to get rid of white people. At any rate, uh, I believe in free movement. I don't care which demographics occupy that country. Oh no, I agree too, Leo, for you. What I mean is morally right, you know. Um, like, for instance, uh, like there are, there are hate crimes done. The white Republican whatever, they'll do them defensively to defend America against the gay menace, making everyone gay or whatever. Whether or not people are being made gay is immaterial. Being gay is better than being straight because it sounds cooler uh, and you get to do gay things. Uh, you know, so in that case, the, the claim then isn't with the, the descriptive what they're saying is happening. It's rather the prescriptive or what should be happening. Are you familiar with the Magnus Hirschfeld Gender Institute that was destroyed by the Nazis? Yes! Uh, basically, a significant amount of research done on trans people was done in the Weimar Republic back in Germany before the Nazis took over. Quite a lot of research. Uh, here are the gays circa one century ago. Never forget your history, my trans compatriots. You have been around for a long time, even in Western civilization. You don't have to go to, you know, some third gender, other society, pre-colonial, this or that. Right here in the West. Uh, and they killed them. They killed them all, and they burnt the books, and burnt the research, and burnt the study. And trans research was sent back 
decades and decades. And now people today, while justifying genocide against you, they can say, well, this is a made up modern 21st century thing. They killed you back then so they could justify killing you again today.